Welcome to this talk on accelerating accelerating sampling in Gromax using the AWH method. <coughs> in this uh, presentation, I will first give an introduction to sampling in general. Then I'll discuss how the AWH method works. Then uh, some short notes on how to use it. And then I'll show an application to computing a potential mean force of permeation of small molecules through the protein aquaporin. So let's start with a general problem formulation. As probably most of you know, energy landscapes of biomolecules are high dimensional and, and often rough. And then uh, this causes issues with sampling the landscape as you might be stuck quite long in local minima. <coughs> and uh, very often sh simulation times, which are now can now be reached uh, of on the order of microseconds are not sufficient to sample states one's in interested in for a particular uh, problem at hand. So typical situations one could encounter is that, for instance, you would know the beginning of the end state of uh, some process of a molecule you're interested in. And then um, the questions could be what are the paths connecting these um, and what are uh, free energy barriers if there are connecting these states. It could also be that you only know the beginning state and you need to, you want to know what motions of interest or other sets of interest there might be. Um, in both these cases, what can be very useful is if you can come up with a reaction coordinate that characterizes differences between these states or that characterizes progress in some direction from a beginning state. So here on the, on the right I've shown uh, uh, an example which is just an artist impression of a free energy landscape where you could have a minimum that you start out on, on the left and you want to go to a minimum on the right which you might know where it is or, or not but uh, it it's useful if you can come up with a, with a general direction um, which this process goes but then one needs an um, if the barriers are too high and the process too slow one needs an enhanced sampling method to accelerate the process of going from one of state to to the other state so that's such a method is what I'll discuss here in this talk today. Yeah, so as, as I said, the typical, a typical issue in molecular dynamic simulations is that interesting events often happen on microsecond time scales of, or longer. So we need billions of, of time steps of two femtoseconds. So this is inconvenient because you spend a lot of time computing and often the time scales can be even longer than that. So um, one needs to, to do something else to to sample faster. But if you look at what's ac actually happening in many cases is that the event or the events one's interested in itself are often quite fast. So um, often the you have to wait a long time for such an event to happen. But when the events happen, it's quite fast. So when that's, when that's actually the case, then it is in principle possible to, to use many independent simulations because you can use a short simulation to sample a short event. Um, and if, if you can have some kind of control over where you sample and how you sample, you can smartly bias simulations, as I'll show, to get more events. So in that way, you can have a more efficient use of, of compute time and also a shorter time to, to solution. So if you can um, increase the number of events and wait less long. So that's a, a general um, an, an approach that provides a lot of advantages. <coughs> so here's a, a, sch a schematic depiction of the of, of the sampling problem. So if you this is in, in one dimension with a, a double well minimum where this single red particle does not have enough um, kinetic energy to cross the barrier within reasonable time of this of this animation. So, but you if you know uh, general reaction dynamics, then you, you'll know that the, the, the time to cross the barrier here goes up exponentially with the height of the barrier. So you can easily get extremely long time scales just if the, if the barrier is a bit too high. <coughs> so you can, wait, you can wait for a very long time here uh, and nothing will happen. So here it would be advantageous, of course, to, to make something happen <coughs> instead of just waiting for a very long time. This is a cheap simulation, but of course, if you look at a very big uh, biomolecular simulation, this could be 
uh, wasting a lot of uh, compute time just some vibrating in a single minimum. So the trick we're going to use here is a, is a, is a well-known trick, which is r rather simple and elegant, is to add a bias potential to make the effective potential flat or close to flat. So if one looks at this double well potential, which is the black line here, um, and uh, the, the sampling is limited simply by the high barrier in the middle. So if one can remove that barrier by adding a, this blue potential, then one would get a flat landscape, which would make the sampling much faster because you would just diffuse over a flat landscape. Uh, but the, the problem here is that this blue potential is the optimal blue potential would be equal to the to the original potential, the dashed black line here, which is often what you don't know. So you need to, to make this work effectively, you need to put in the answer of the uh, yeah of part of the question you're interested in. So uh, you need an iterative method to solve this because you don't know the answer to start with. Um, so for that you need some iterative solver. Um, so what I'll present today is the accelerated weight histogram method, but there are more methods. I mean, there's metadynamics, there's adaptive biasing force, there have been very many methods here in the literature uh, available for solving this problem. Some are, um, or originally started ad, ad hoc, but some have, have improved, have a more solid mathematical uh, statistic, statistical mechanic basis behind them. These are probably a few of the most popular ones at the moment. Um, but I'll discuss the accelerated weight histogram method, which has been in implemented natively into, into Gromax, which we've been working on and I'm one of the developers of. Okay, so the, what, what, what makes this method somewhat different from other methods is that the target distribution is a central quantity. So um, you can decide beforehand what kind of distribution you want to sample along one or more reaction coordinates. And that's unlike many other methods that use you bias and you don't directly control the target distribution. In a good method, there should always be a target distribution, but it might be given implicitly or have only a single shape. So here you can set it freely. Um, and it can, but it doesn't have to depend on the, on the free energy. So you can have a flat landscape as I, I, as I just illustrated on the previous slide, but it can also be some enhanced temperature sampling. Uh, it has initial exponential convergence and later, later it goes with the square root of the number of samples. So this is a big advantage. So in the, in the end stage, any method, the error should go down as the square root time of square root number of samples. But initially, when the errors are much larger than, than the thermal energy, Kt, you can converge exponentially, which gives a much faster convergence. And this is automatically controlled. There's only one uncritical convergence parameter, as I'll discuss later. So most of the work on the method has been done by a former PhD student of mine called uh, Viva Kalinda. And the uh, um, man manuscript of the method is, is given here. So how the method schematically works is that we extend the ensemble with reaction coordinates, can be one or multidimensional lambda, and then one runs a, a, a biased simulation uh, for a short while. This provides new samples and then from that, you can estimate what the real distribution is. So initially you have some initial bias, which is usually uh, no, zero, no bias at all, which is of course indirect, in incorrect, because uh, there is some p potential, some barrier or so that you want to um, remove. So uh, looking at what your bias you put in and what samples you get out, you can estimate the real distribution. Uh, this is done in, with efficient updates uh, here for this. And then one can, know, having this information, one can update the bias. And here the target distribution is included explicitly. Um, and then get out a new bias and then one iterates around here until you're happy with the convergence. Um, here in formulas, it's shown how this goes. So in the top, again, the, the process. At the bottom, you can see that the updates of the free energy estimate they go with the, the, the collected samples you have here, this delta W, that are the, the collected new weights, and you divide by the, t the total number of samples and the target distribution, which comes in explicitly. So this tells you the D, how much your samples deviate from what you expected, and that's you correct the free energy with that, which gives a convergence of 1 over n, as it should, or sorry, an update size change of 1 over n. 
So how does AWH apply this bias? So initially we use the harmonic umbrella potential, which is moved using Monte Carlo moves. Um, now we, by default, do a kind of Boltzmann inversion of, of the convolution of the, of the effect of these potentials, so of the Gaussians. Uh, this produces a, a nice smooth bias. And this is done on a regular grid, considering only neighbors, so only close neighbors. So this is uh, rather fast because we don't have to track positions of all the, all the biases. They're nicely on the, on the grid, which makes for efficient code. So here's an example of, uh, of how this works now for this double well potential. So here you see how the, the blue bias potential slowly converges to the, to the black line. And at the top, it's now we have this initial phase where there's exponential uh, uh, convergence towards the target distribution. This simulation stops right after the initial phase where you see that now you got a quite good estimate of the free energy and now already you have quite diffusive motion over the landscape. So now the method would shift to the final phase where you get the normal one over square root t or square root n behavior to converge the free energy exactly to the to the landscape. Um, yeah, so there's this update size, so here you can see how the update size in, in a simple toy example goes down initially ex exponentially and then later goes as 1 over square root, uh, sorry, it's 1 over t, the update size. Um, and the weights, the weights then need to be updated consistently with this. Um, so initially the weight is fixed, um, which is shown here on the left. On the left, oh, sorry, on the left is the, is the update size, on the right is the, is the weights, which are a bit strange initially because if you don't change the, the update size, then the weights go up of samples uh, initially, but um, these initial weights, they get weighted out exponentially because of the exponential initial phase. So you get in the end to a flat um, weight distribution as it should be that all samples are weighted equally. So this provides very nice quick initial convergence and then correct convergence at the end. So the initial update size is basically the only parameter you need to set after choosing a reaction coordinate. Um, so that determines how fast you flatten out the landscape. Um, th this is in Gromax provided by setting two parameters, but actually only sets one um, because the update size is an, an intuitive parameter. So we set the diffusion along the reaction coordinate and an, an initial error estimate. Um, so these parameters are not critical and these default values that we have in Gromax work, work quite okay. At the bottom here, you can see in the formula how these actually contribute to the initial update size. Um, <coughs> so one can play around with one of the two. Um, they, they are not, uh, they go into the same final parameter in the end. Uh, so yeah, the only thing that can go wrong is if you have far too large parameters here, then you get very slow convergence because the update size is very slow. Um, so not much happens. If you have too small parameters, the system might be pulled apart, but you'll see that. So. Uh, but there's a quite a large range to play with here um, and things can work well. And if it goes wrong, you'll notice. Okay, so then uh, um, a final method note before we go to applications is that one can also use multiple uh, what we call walkers to contribute to this bias and compute the free energy. So there's no reason to limit the sampling phase in AWH to a single simulation. So you can run multiple and they'll contribute to the same weights and to the same free energy updates. Um, so then they can run independently uh, apart from that they share the bias and then of course get updated. Uh, yeah, they have to update the bias to, to feel the effects of the, of the other copies. So then the question is how many copies can be run and how does the convergence depend on the number of copies? So I'll get to back to that later for the application. So here's an example. I think these are four walkers, but a bit difficult to see in this past movie. So you see it converges much faster now and they all happily move over the landscape to create a very, to create this uh, smooth uh, potential. So here, this is in the same time scale as the original uh, movie, so it goes much faster as you see. It actually goes more than, more than four times as fast, uh, but I'll get back to that later. Okay, then the application I would like to show here to highlight the method. So this is um, on the protein aquaporin, which in principle, as the name says, it's a, it's permeates allows permeation of water through a membrane, cell membrane. Um, so it's a, uh, <coughs> it's, it consists of four, four monomers, which each have a, have a channel uh, in the middle. Um, and in this case, we're interested in a bacterial channel, which also can uh, conduct uh, ammonia, depending on yeah, the sequence. So we are looking at, at slight mutations, which uh, make it easier for ammonia to permeate. 
so we're interested in how that functions. So that was what the study is for, which is referenced here. Um, so one has in this channel, one has a water chain uh, a and a very fancy selection mechanism to only allow water to permeate and no other molecules, except, well, in this case, if you change something, NH3, ammonia can go through. So that's also of interest to understand how the channel selectivity actually works. Um, so as a reaction coordinate here, we use the Z-coordinate, rather simple, of the system. So that's the, the direction through the pore. Um, for water, we can use equilibrium simulations since there's water as a solvent, so we don't need to do bias simulations. But for ammonia, we use the AWH method. Um, and two notes to make here, which are general about the method, is that if you do umbrella sampling, which you could also do, then you can block rearrangements of the pore, or in general one can block rearrangements in the system because you fix an important coordinate which makes the rest of the system is more difficult for the rest of the system to cross barriers. You can also force an iron through, as was done um, uh, a long time ago, uh, decades ago, uh, because the simulation times were too short, but then you can lead, this can lead to non-equilibrium artifacts and hysteresis because you might pull the system out of equilibrium. Okay, so here are some, some results shown of PMFs, so for different, so the uh, blue is, w is water and red, uh, oh sorry, no, uh, blue is, uh, is the original um, acroporin and red is a, is a double mutant. And then you can see that here we show on the top the charm force field and the bottom results for amber, which differ a bit. Um, but especially for charm here, you can see that the, 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 the mutant makes the water chain much more structured um, compared to the wild type. Um, and you can see quite, quite some differences for ammonia here in the, uh, the way the permeation goes. So the mutant is less permeable for, for, for ammonia. But you get, as you see, you can get very detailed PMFs here from these simulations because the, the, the ammonia moves back and forth in this method through the channel and samples very well. So then the simulation time to solution. So here one can see how the convergence goes as a function of the number of or well, it's a function of time, but for different numbers of walkers. So if you do a single walker, you get this black dashed line. But if I do two walkers, then actually the time to solution more than halves. So it's nearly four times as short. So you get super linear scaling here. And that's, we think, because if you have only one walker, it goes into one minimum and then it, it, it moves to the next minimum and then hangs around there for a long time, uh, increasing the, or decreasing the free energy estimate there. Uh, so you get, you get time correlations due to this and lags, whereas if you have multiple walkers, this is much less of an effect since they sample at different parts of the energy landscape on average. Um, so for this case, we you can go up to 32 walkers and still have a gain. 64 seems to be getting worse here, which is a bit strange, but there's quite some gain up to, up to quite high. So that's our general experience with biomolecular simulations is that you get gains up to quite high numbers of walkers. So and this reduces your time to solution significantly and can lead to nice parallelization. Um, so if we look at what the time to solution is, so here we set as a target an er error in the PMF or the from yeah from beginning to, to the end of the channel of a half kilojoule per mole. Then here we can see um, uh, two curves which are for different numbers of walkers. So you see initially a quite rapid drop of time to solution because of the initial uh, the gain for going one walk from one walker to, to more. Um, and then the gain gets less if you go to, to more walkers. Um, so here we've also looked at a recent improvement of Gromax where we uh, have enabled direct in collaboration with NVIDIA direct communication between GPUs through NVLink. Uh, so not involving the CPU anymore for doing communication when we compute things on the GPU. So this allowed us to use four GPUs per, per walker um, instead of just one. So we were able to use to run this showcase on the whole of the, of the machine Putti at CSC in Finland, which is one of the few machines which has direct links between GPUs. And we can get down to a time of solution for, for, of, of six hours, which would otherwise be... Um, well, in worst case, uh, 192 hours for one walker uh, with one GPU per walker. So then to conclude, we have a very robust accelerated sampling method here in AWH, which has few parameters. And it's, uh, as I haven't discussed here, is um, there's good checks 
to, to check if the method actually converges or not and if there are problems, especially with your reaction coordinates. There's only a single parameter that controls convergence, that's this initial update size, and it's not very sensitive. It supports 1D up to 4D reaction coordinates. I've only shown 1D here. There's an example of a 2D case for, for DNA shown here next on the side. It supports multiple walkers, which leads to can lead to quite uh, high parallelization efficiency and super linear scaling when going from one to more, um, which makes it work efficiently in parallel and you can freely choose the number of, of, of uh, ranks to use, which is also nice. But as a general note, the challenge is still to come up with a good reaction coordinate. So that's a, always a problem with, or yeah, that can be a large problem with any system. But at least now, if you have those reaction coordinates, we have a very good method in Gromax that can sample those such reaction coordinates uh, quite efficiently. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>